Hi everyone! I am so excited for this workshop. If you are watching um, rather than listening, you will see that I'm actually sitting out in my garden. It is currently 25 degrees here in Scotland and that is super, super warm for the Scots. So I'm out here celebrating the sunshine. I have unfortunately had to shift over slightly into the shade because I couldn't see my phone. So hence why it doesn't maybe look as nice here but it is absolutely scorching so I had to celebrate it and that is why I continue to do what I do to show you how adaptable we can all be when it comes to um, well-being, self-care and how we can really truly make a difference to our lives. So things like sitting out in the garden and doing a bit of work when you have the capacity to do so really reflecting on those little changes that really contribute to making a difference. So let's get going. So first of all, thank you so much for tuning in. And if you're watching this, this shows, this proves that you are here to make a difference because this specific workshop on why British people are programmed to put themselves second is a really uncomfortable topic. It's something that's really ballsy, it's brash, it's something that's very bold, all the bees. And the reason why I really wanted to do this was because when I speak to people about coaching or when I'm talking about coaching programs, prices, I get that real sense of being uncomfortable. Not me, but from others, because what I find is the concepts that we're talking about can ultimately cause people specifically from Britain to feel really uncomfortable themselves. And this made me really reflect on why this was. What was going on? Why were people feeling uncomfortable when I was talking about well-being and um, making changes in your life to ensure that you feel really positive and happy? Why were people feeling uncomfortable when I was talking about committing to big programs, really dedicating um, your journey of supporting your well-being on that longevity, that longer journey, why was I getting those responses? And what came to me was that there's such a difference in culture specifically towards British people around our perception of supporting ourselves, well-being, what that looks like, and really how our culture can, I guess, affect our reality, can affect how we interact with these specific concepts. And I see this day in and day out, and that's why I really wanted to create a specific um, training module on this, because I believe this is something that we really need to change. It's something that's really important. We have to start prioritizing ourselves. Um, but anyway, let me get into it first of all. So, I'd love to know first of all who is actually British here. So, are you from Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, Republic of Ireland? Um, sorry, Northern Ireland. <laughs> no political uh, fights here, please. Apologies for that. Um, so, yeah, please let me know if you are originally from Britain, if you still live in Britain, and if you are already starting to nod and smile when I'm talking about some of these concepts. So, please continue to interact in the comments and make sure that you contribute as much as possible because these trainings are here to support you as much as I can do. So, what I've done is I've broken these concepts up into five different areas. So, <clears throat> why British people are programmed to put themselves as second. The first one, and I would love for you to put a number one in the comments if you have heard this expression, I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. Because what you find is this specific phrase is repeated and repeated by British people. Well, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Um, oh, I don't really know, they're really private, they don't talk, they don't share what's going on with them. This closed door mentality has allowed for such negative impacts to happen to people within Britain. A classic one is domestic abuse. <clears throat> what I find is when we're talking about we don't know what's going on behind closed doors, domestic abuse is a huge one, that coercive control. 
um, is something that quite often happens and because that British mentality of we don't know what goes on behind closed doors therefore we don't ask is so dangerous and this is why people's well-beings can be affected so badly. So for example if you um, had seen uh, <clears throat> a person who had suffered from you know abuse or they weren't feeling right not asking them and accepting that you know we don't know what goes on behind those doors and that's okay that could leave someone at significant risk of harm and i'm really starting with this um, example because i'm coming in strong because these are things that need to change i watch <clears throat> i watch so much true crime documentaries and what i find is quite often especially in britain people will say i did wonder i did see this but i never asked because this is something that um, was going on behind closed doors and I had no right to ask that. I didn't want to be nosy. And having that mentality really highlights why British people put themselves second because there's not that urgency to ask if people are okay. So put another one in the comments if this is, an, if this is a phrase that you have heard before. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. And really being curious around why um, particularly British people are really starting to um, see this as something that's just part of them, something that's acceptable within society. So I would love to hear what your thoughts are about that initial one. The second one I wanted to speak about around why British people are not putting themselves first is because we find it very normal that we don't ask for help. So put a number two in the comments if this is you, if this is something that you resonate with, because what we find is asking for help for some reason in Britain seems to be a weakness. Um, it seems to be like a taboo subject. And I definitely saw that when I was in social work. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Tracy, I'm sure you'll have seen this too in your previous lines of work where you know, people who have been supported and asking for help, they are often stigmatised, whether it's by um, themselves or others, when they just need a bit of support during specific times in their lives. We see this especially with um, single mothers. I see this so often where single mothers are balancing jobs and children and unpaid labour, doing all the housework, doing so much different activities and not feeling empowered to ask for help, even though they're truly deserving of it. So that not normalizing asking for help is another key reason why British people are really programmed to putting themselves um, second. Absolutely, and thanks for, for recognizing that, Tracy. And Al, yes, I think it's feeling of being judged too. You're totally right. And the fact that we are starting to feel judged by not asking for help really highlights that continuation um, I've certainly felt that as well when I've asked for help when I've been struggling um, for example in previous lines of work I have not um, been offered that support because it looks like I'm not capable or something like that and that's not the case at all it just means I'm open to support when I feel I need it so I love that you ladies are also recognizing this and you know because recognizing really allows us to start to change this mentality so normalizing asking for help really recognizing on how powerful it can be when we really do start to make these conversations amongst ourselves the third one and this is very closely connected the taboo of being in receipt of coaching, counselling or therapy. If you feel brave, put a number three in the comments and whether it's <clears throat> recognising that you would like um, coaching, therapy or counselling but have never felt able to, to go to it because of that taboo or because you have had coaching, therapy or counselling but you've never shared it because of that taboo. When I um, received counselling previously, I was met with lots of weird looks when I said, oh, I'm going to counselling. And people were like, well, what's wrong with you? Um, so really celebrating that coaching, counselling and therapy can literally change your life. Had I not have gone to counselling 
um, going to therapy, I've already got a coach, I'm always talking to her. Had I not have taken that, um, that step out of my comfort zone and started asking for support from specialised people, there's no way I'd be sitting here doing what I'm doing just now. There's no way I would have had the strength to make changes in my life. There's no way I would have been able to do half the stuff that I've managed to do. And really recognising how powerful coaching, counselling and therapy can be and how detrimental it is if you aren't able to ask for that because of this this stigma, Al, as you say, that you know, that concern of being judged, that taboo around this specific area. So really reflecting on what it means to you um and other people that you're connected with around this taboo of being subject to uh, counselling, you know, having gone to a therapist, what does it look like if you have a coach? Um, because genuinely I feel that that's something that should be celebrated because if you're taking those active steps and engaging in services that genuinely will help you, I think that's such a powerful shift that you can really introduce in your life. But I do see it all the time. I see British people really struggling to accept that they need or want to go to counselling, that they need or want to access um, therapy or coaching or anything like that because of that taboo that comes with it. And when you think of our neighbours across the sea, the Americans, um, put a number four in the comments if you're American and you're watching, generally it seems to be part of their culture to go to therapy, to have a coach. It's very normalised and it's something that we really truly recognise as something that um, is really acceptable. You see it in... Um, reality TV, you see it in sort of programmes, oh I'm going to my therapist and that's just not something that British people seem to have managed to catch up with. But I do love that we are starting to recognise um, the, the power of really engaging in counselling and therapy and coaching. You know I am hearing a little bit more of people saying oh I'm going to my therapist this week so really starting to acknowledge that we are starting to change but we do have some time to go to ensure that we're not programming ourselves to be second best we have to work towards putting ourselves first because you can't pour from a half empty cup the fourth one and I love this one because this is especially Scottish the pride of being a grafter Put a number three, or what number are we on now? Put a number four um, in the comments if you recognise this. So for those who are who don't use this terminology, a grafter is simply someone who works really hard. So put a number four in the comments if you are this person. I am, and I still am. I can't get out of the habit of it. I love working myself really hard. I love telling people, oh, I've worked so hard this week. Oh, this is how many hours I've done. How do we do this? This is such a British mentality once again. We're really proud of hard workers. Yeah, Tracy, this is something that you relate to as well. Um, this is something that we say it time and time again and we normalise it. And it's really starting to understand that having this culture in place, we're working ourselves into the bone is normal, is expected, makes it really, really hard to pull that back. I have always felt like I needed to work over and above my working hours. I've always felt like I need to have numerous jobs. I always feel like I need to justify to myself and to others that I'm a hard worker, so therefore I'm deserving of my job and deserving of the wage. Why do we really need to, to engage like that? Because it's something that we really need to really recognise the impacts that that will have on you. And Tracy, yeah, you used to work seven days a week. Seven days a week, you know, that's so long and that's not, you know, allowing for breaks or anything like that. And, you know, it's amazing that you were able to do that, but really reflecting on how that can really affect your well-being. It can affect our stress levels, our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health. We can become subject to burnout, <clears throat> excuse me, we can be subject to 
um, PTSD to acute stress disorder. There's so many conditions, high blood pressure, heart attacks. There's so many health um, impacts that working ourselves into the ground can really have on ourselves and recognizing this and starting to challenge this view that the British people have of I'm proud of being a grafter, we really need to start taking a step back and really reflecting on what that truly looks like for us. And what I find is this is something I'm still working on. This is still something that I'm having to reflect on because it's built into our um, culture, it's built into our programming, it's how we view ourselves, it's how our friends are, it's how our colleagues are, our bosses, our parents, everyone seems to be off this mentality that you have to work yourself into the ground to feel deserving and having that can really have a negative impact on your well-being so it's really starting to reflect on what that truly looks like and how we can start to break down that negative messaging of having to work ourselves into the ground. The fifth one and this is a really interesting one so put a number five in the comments if you were brought up with the value of always put others before yourself this is something that i was brought up with this is something that my parents were brought up with my sister so many people in my life so this very typical sort of almost christian value of always put others before yourself love thy neighbor right really great value to have but what we find is when we have been brought up in that specific way it can really affect our ability to start prioritizing ourselves. If we have learned that we have to put others before ourselves, continuing to do that will have huge catastrophic implications for ourselves as individuals. If we continue to not try to prioritize ourselves, say prioritize work, prioritize other people, prioritize um, other people's well-being over our own, so that always putting others before yourself, loving thy neighbour, all of that values that British people have typically been brought up to do and to believe and to reinforce within their lives is hugely detrimental. Think of that message that you are telling yourself. You're telling yourself that you're not worthy of being first. Of, you know, that it's something that you should be ashamed of, of putting yourself first and not... Um, really reflecting on what you need as a person you need to reflect on other people and that is such a British quality that I see from day in and day out oh well I wanted to um, do this but I felt like I need to stay on work and support this other person or I wasn't able to change this because and generally when we are focusing on other people's well-being it's such a beautiful thing to do that we need to prioritize our first in order to allow ourselves to support other people. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this because these are really, really controversial um, sort of concepts that I'm discussing, but really, really relevant, especially right now, especially in the pandemic, because what we found was all of these, I don't know what goes on behind closed doors, not normalizing asking for help the taboo of coaching counseling and therapy the pride of being a grafter always putting others before yourselves how much did that all of those five concepts come into play during the covid pandemic so really leaving yourself with that thought on how much all of those areas really affected us so i would love to hear your thoughts on that as always I have a worksheet so I would love to um, go through this with you as always if you would like the free handout make sure you drop a link in the comments below so what I want you to reflect on is to do a really big brain debrief so really reflecting on all these topics that we have covered so the first one I want you to reflect on is what is your experience within the topic of I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. So what does that look like? What has been your life experience around this? I then want you to ask yourself the same question around not normalising asking for help. So again, what has been your experience with that? What does that look like for you? 
what was the impact that that had for you of not being able to ask for help when you truly needed it? The third one, the taboo of coaching, counselling and therapy. So once again, how did it affect you of that taboo? Did it stop you from engaging in coaching, counselling and therapy? Did it really hinder your ability to flourish because you felt you weren't able to share what was going on with yourself? So really reflecting on your experiences of that as well. The pride of being a hard worker, that's probably my biggest um, one that I still struggle with. So really reflecting on what part of your identity you want that to play in. Do you really enjoy being acknowledged as a hard worker? I know I do. So how can you reach that point where you are recognised as someone that ded that's dedicated to their job, to their mission in life, but also I'm over the flight path, so excuse the aeroplane that's going off past my head. <laughs> So really reflecting on what that looks like and how you can get that balance of being you know, dedicated and feeling empowered within your line of work, but equally how you can preserve your self-care and really ensure that you are prioritising yourself and not being subject to burnout and stress um, as much as you could have been doing or have done in the past. The next one is always putting others before yourself. So really reflecting on what that's done to yourself. Is that a value that um, you relate to? And if so, what detriments has that caused you? So really reflecting on that last one as well. And then I would love to hear your top takeaways from today's training. What have you learned? What's resonated with you? Has there been anything that you've not agreed with? Has there been anything that has maybe hit home a bit for you and you've really started to recognise how being British has programmed you to become um, second best in your life? So I would love to hear more about your thoughts. As always, feel free to drop me a message or book a clarity call with myself. Um, because yeah, I'm so fascinated by this subject and I would love to hear your own individual perceptions of it. Thank you to those who have engaged in today's training. It's been really insightful to see your views as well. And as always, I'm sending you so much love and light and I will see you next week.